Hey folks, it is Carrie Oberbrunner and I have with me an incredibly special guest, someone I've done coffee with at Froth, Frothy Monkey, someone who's spoken <laughs> on the Igniting Soul stage, someone who is the brand new, I'm going to say father of this book. I think, <laughs> I think you gave birth to it. And I love it. I mean, look at it. It looks like it's popping off. I love it. This is such a cool cover. Jeff Brown, Thank great you. to see you here. Great to be here, Carrie. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Listen, we are going to have a good time today. We're going to be giving away uh, some prizes. You have some bonuses as well. This is not the official launch day, but it's pretty close. And Jeff, first of all, you are the man who interviews a lot of people about their books. I, I cannot give up this cover. I mean, whoever designed that, it is like popping. I love it. Um but listen, man, is writing a book tough? Yes, um, not as tough as I anticipated. I, I put it off for a long time because I was overwhelmed by it, because I thought it was tough, um, tougher than it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a couple of people tell me, Jeff, why did you co-write a book? That's harder than writing it solo, which I did not know. <laughs> so that was news to me. Yes. Supposedly, that's I thought that was the easier way to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, Last year, I had let go of a couple of things in my business in anticipation for doing more public speaking and in-person workshops, and yes. then COVID happened. Mm. And so I wasn't as busy as I thought I was going to be, and so I had plenty of time to write it. So that was the silver lining I tried to find in all that was going on in the world last year. Yes, absolutely. Well, you did take advantage of the time. I mean, I have to just read some of these endorsements, folks, because this is powerful. Mm. You have You have Seth Godin. Uh, talking <laughs> about uh, this is a, a a good book that can shortcut to the change you need to make. Um, mm -hmm. You have Stephen Covey, Michael Hyatt, John Acuff, Mark Victor Hansen, Mark Miller, Brian Tracy, Pamela Wilson, Dan Miller, and I have a signed copy. Lucky me. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. So why do you think so many thought leaders are basically saying, I get it. Uh, this makes mm. sense. What, why do you think it's resonating? Yeah, all of those thought leaders happen to be authors. And I think authors first are readers. Um, mm. They understand that uh, being a voracious reader makes for being a good writer, right? Um, I, I think oftentimes as, as authors, we sit down to the proverbial blank page uh, and rack our brains trying to figure out where to begin, where do I start? Um, but if yeah. we're consistent and intentional readers and with that comes uh, taking notes and synthesizing those notes and and doing a good job of cataloging the things that we're learning as we learn them yes when we sit down to that otherwise blank page we're, it's really not a blank page we're starting with all these notes and this knowledge we've gained from all the books we've read first and and, and it's never a blank page when you think about it like that that's really good. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Let's talk about the parts. I, I, I love table of contents. Okay? Because <laughs> Let me the, open it so I can remind myself of what those are. <laughs> that's right. Well, to me, it, it, it reminds it, it reminds me of where we're going. You know, to me, mm. a book is a journey and the table of contents is the road signs. And, yeah. you know, when you when I open up a table of contents, by the way, I love the look inside feature on Amazon because it allows me to see where is the author's brain space. You mm -hmm. say why you need to read books. So you start with why you do the Simon Sinek thing right there. Start with mm -hmm. why. Then part two is the books you need to read. And then part three is the smarter way to read books. This is mm -hmm. interesting. So talk to us about part one why you need to read books. Yeah, so we recognize that uh, there are a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people, this is not the case for many in your audience, many watching this in my audience right now, but for much of the world, reading is something most people don't place importance on. If you look at the recent studies or the latest stats and, and research, most people don't read a book or two a year, if, if at all. And, and so we realize, we recognize that if we're going to evangelize mm -hmm. people to read more, we've got to pay attention to that majority. And we spend the first four chapters trying to make the argument for why this is a habit they need to cultivate. 
And if you'll give us, if you're one of those people, if you'll give us, you know, four chapters, our hope is that we've convinced you. Uh, and then parts two and three then pick up from there. So if you're already someone who is convinced this is a habit worth cultivating, maybe it's a habit you already cultivate, the good news for you is you can skip part one unless you just want to be affirmed in the decisions that you've made. Yes. And you can go right to part two and three. I'll tell you what, there's some great quotes out there, but one of them is that the person who you're going to be a year from now is based on the books that you're reading today. Yeah. And that is so true. Um, Jeff, I, for years, especially when I had really young kids, I didn't have a lot of bandwidth to read. Hmm. And so what I did is I started jumping into audiobooks because I like to exercise. Mm -hmm. I like to redeem the time. I knew I was driving. And so I just said, you know what, when, when my friend started saying, you got to read that book, you got to read that book mm. rather than oh, feeling guilty. You know, I just um, I just said, I'm going to listen to the books. Talk to us about, you know, mm. ebooks, audio books, physical mm. books. Um, talk to us about all these versions. Is this a good thing? Yeah, it's absolutely a good thing. Reading. A book, regardless of the way you're reading it, is better than not reading it at all. I think it was Mark Twain who said, the man who doesn't read has no advantage over the man who can't, right? Okay. Um, and you say in your book, uh, to say, uh, or in, in my book, you say, I should say, I've quoted you on this, and you say, um, if you say you don't want to read or you say you uh, uh, don't desire or need to read, you're basically saying, I don't need to think. Ooh. It's it's hubris, right? It's it's hubris to think that we've got it all figured out. Not reading books suggests that that's what you think. You've got it all figured out. That was me for the better part of my 20s. So I think regardless of the style of, of book or, or a format of book you read, it's, it's better than reading nothing at all. Um, I, like you, um, I leveraged my commute time early in my career with audiobooks. A lot of people will say, you know, well, audiobooks, that's not really reading a book. It is, as far as I'm concerned, it is in, in my book, especially if your season of life dictates that that's one of your few options. Same for ebooks. Now, if I had a preference, and I do, uh, my preference is the physical book. Uh, I think there's something special that happens in the brain, much like writing by hand versus yes. typing on a keyboard, when you're holding a physical book and spatially, there's a left side and a right side. And the way our brain interacts with that physical book, I think is is different than with an ebook or an audiobook. And I also think that ultimately, if you're reading a book uh, with information that you want to retain and put into action later and you want to make sure you comprehend it, I think that's going to be easier to do with a physical book at Ooh, the end of the day. Nice, nice. So Jeff has given us some edgy content here, like <laughs> the superiority of, um, of print books. But, you know, I, I see what you're saying. And uh, what I often do, Jeff, is... I'll listen to an audiobook and you can kind of drift. Um, mm. and therefore, what I do is I open up the notes tab on my phone. Um, so right there, the notes tab. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that I have, um, in fact, I'm just going to show you this right now so you can see exactly what I'm talking mm. about. Um, I have in here, for example, Kotler the art of impossible you see that mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's an example of me listening to an audiobook and then saying oh my gosh i gotta write that note down and you see here <laughs> here's my notes and rather mm. than sit there and write it i just press the microphone and i mm. speak it so mm. i say i say um uh you know i um fear is a constant in peak performance that's you know that was Fear is a constant in peak mm. performance. So what I do is, uh, you know, and then I'll even go buy the physical book. Is that ever happen where you kind of do the audio book and if it's really good, you'll mm. buy the physical book. Yeah, an audio book is a great way to audition books. Uh, Mark Miller of Chick-fil-A, who uh, endorsed the book, talks about that. Um, and, and my podcast for years has been a way for people to audition books. Something I've tried in recent years, the first time I did this with, was with uh, Brendan Burchard's High Performance Habits. Oh, yeah. I started listening to the audiobook and, and speeding it up to one and a half or 1.75 speed 
while following Brendan reading his physical book. No way. It's, it's almost like a speed reading cheat. I can't read it that fast myself as fast as Brendan was reading it with the audiobook sped up, but I like combining those two mediums, the audiobook in my ears and the physical book in my hands as I follow along. I I've can comprehend and retain that. one of them. I've never it's, done it's fun. That. <laughs> I'm going to seriously consider doing that because <laughs> it's almost like uh, we say it, it's, it's immersion. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally. immersing yourself. Um, let's go into this. Uh, okay. So, you know, why you need you, you, in part one, it's uh, I'm just going to read the chapter titles because I think they're fascinating. <laughs> why you need to read like your career depends on it. Let me guess, because it does. <laughs> right? it, 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 it does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's going to increase your professional opportunities, uh, your decision making skills. Uh, your ability to lead, uh, your intellect, uh, and and you know they talk. You hear a lot of talk today about the soft skills, right, and how important they are. They're soft skills, which is kind of a misnomer of a name, but they're vital today to have those soft oh, yeah. skills. And reading is going to help with things like communication and creativity and empathy. Things that are in so so important in relationship building and culture building within an organization. So yeah, reading is going to help with all those things. All right, man, I got to share this. This is true. This this literally happened in the last week. Someone came to me discouraged that mm. um, they, this, this person, nobody knows them here, so I can talk about the person. Um, they had a test that gave them bad news about their genes, about their mm. genetics. And this person was bummed, and I could tell that they were bummed. And I said to this person, well, I get why you're bummed, but don't you know about epigenetics? And the person was like, no, mm. what's epigenetics? And I said, like, this is the reality that you can turn on certain genes and turn off certain genes based upon environment, based upon thoughts. And the person thought I was like messing with them. <laughs> right. And I said, well, they said, well, how do you know this? I said, Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Um, mm. I said, Dr. Joe Dispenza. And then the person said, well, can, do you have those? And I said, yeah, let me get them <laughs> for you. And I'm telling you, Jeff, I literally changed this person's, I'm going to say life, certainly their attitude, mm. certainly their perspective. They were thinking I'm done. And now they're thinking there's hope. <laughs> and it was through a book. Talk about mm. that. Do you think that's uh, normal? I mean, what, what do you think? You think books are that powerful? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they're that powerful. I think that's a fantastic example of, of the power of, of books right there. I'm not sure that, that that's going to be easy to top. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, the, the funny thing is about most people, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but uh, when it comes to a resistance to reading, uh, there there's this uncomfortableness because um, you know people don't want to learn by and large. That's that's mm -hmm. most of of the country uh, because learning means acknowledging uh, at least briefly that you don't know something, and we're taught to avoid that. Ooh, and so it's easier deep. just yeah, it's easier just not to learn and just get back to whatever we were doing, right? Wow. And, and the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is people don't want to change their minds. If a book is going to help you get somewhere you've been unable to get to on your own, you're going to have to change your mind about something. So both of those things cause us discomfort. And one thing I've learned from reading yes. uh, and, and a lot of it from uh, folks like John Maxwell mm. is uh, when we when we feel discomfort towards something, something that we that relates to you know goals we have, things we want to achieve, and we allow that discomfort to push us away. The thing we need to remember is if we avoid that uh, sacrifice uh, and, and, and discipline because of the pain that it brings, there's a different kind of pain that we experience later, and that's the pain of, of regret. And so you know we have a choice. We can push through the pain that comes from sacrificing growth today, and maybe that's reading for you, and avoid the pain of regret later, or we can avoid those others now and have the regret to follow up in due time. And I'd rather avoid the pain of regret if it were me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, talk about these bonuses. 
because I love the quote that you said, but but this is pretty nuts, man. Like you're giving away. It's one of those things where like this book that Jeff wrote could unlock to you new relationships, new thoughts, new projects. But then you also throw on these amazing things. Talk about what we have on this page here. Yeah, for anyone who uh, pre-orders the book and uh, pre-order is still in play through Monday, uh, August 30th, uh, there are at least five different bonuses uh, that you acquire. Uh, you get the book, first of all, for 40% off if you choose Baker Bookhouse as the retailer. Uh, but you get a mini course that my co-author Jesse Wisniewski and I have, have created, a four-module mini course that helps you implement the concepts from the book. Um, you get the audio book. For free. So if you're an audiobook fan, like we talked about earlier, Jeez. purchase the physical book at 40% off and get the audiobook. There's a couple of uh, resources I've written. Uh, one called the 12 all time best business and personal development books uh, and uh, reasons why those books are ranked the way they are and what others on my podcast have had to say mm -hmm. about those books and recommending them. Um, a resource I wrote called Dream Big Five Personal Habits That Will Supercharge Your Life. And these are the habits I have found the nearly 400 people I've interviewed the last eight years all have in common. These successful people such as yourself do these five things by and large. Uh, there's a bonus chapter that I wrote that I didn't get finished in time to get into the book, unfortunately, called uh, Growing the Best Version of You. And only people who pre-order the book will ever see that bonus chapter. Wow! And then uh, as you did, uh, you get uh, an autographed uh, copy yes. of the book. Again, if you go through Baker Bookhouse, you get the yes. autographed book plate and you get 40% off through the 30th of now, August. Where, how do you order from Baker? Do you have a link here? Uh, yeah, when you go to readtoleadbook.com, uh, yeah. you've got six options uh, to order through there on the site. Just choose Baker. And when you choose Baker, uh, you'll uh, you click that link and go there automatically. And that 40% discount is automatically applied. You don't have to do wow. anything. So read to lead And then when you see the options of retailers, choose Baker books for that 40% discount. I love it, man. <laughs> gotcha. So I just click right here. Yeah. Can you yeah. see my screen? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I click there yeah. and I get 40% off in the audio book. That is nuts, folks. Listen, 1139. Come on. <laughs> That's <now>. all it is. <laughs> Come on. And you're getting a course and you're getting uh, the audio book and the, the bonus chapter and the downloadables. And But it's only good until Monday. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. By the way, who's this guy? <laughs> Who is that good-looking guy? Oh, you mean the one on the right? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't <laughs> yeah, that, know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's my friend Jesse Wisniewski, who up until recently lived in the same town as me. He just moved back to his hometown uh, in, uh, in in West Virginia. Okay. Uh, but Jesse uh, is a guy I met at a conference uh, several years ago and uh, followed up with me a few years later and said, hey, I've got an idea for a book. Have you ever thought about a book about writing a book about books. <laughs> and I was like, well, I thought about writing a book, but not on, not that meta. Uh, yeah. What were you thinking? And so uh, he had an idea for a book called uh, The Reader's Edge at the time, very much up my alley. And and he had uh, attempted to get this uh, published and, and, and he kept getting feedback along the lines of, you don't have a platform, you don't have a platform, you don't have a platform. And so he thought, since I did have a platform, we could combine our efforts and, and go that route. And so that's what we did. Uh, and you're now 15 months later, uh, about a year and a half later, here we are. It's finally coming out. So, uh, yeah, we're excited. All right, man. I'm going to ask you a few more things here. Sure. Because we are speaking to a lot of authors. By the way, the person who is most engaged is going <laughs> to get a signed copy of this. So what do I mean by that? That means tagging people it means sharing this if you tag it uh show us below if you mm. share it type shared we want to we want to gift someone a signed copy and uh, we want to see that but you and i sat in the frothy monkey in tennessee and mm. it was a different book you were going to write mm. you were gonna write a book about yeah. your dogs and, <laughs> yeah, that's and, right. and, and remember this i mean it, i i'll never forget and yeah it was um almost like dr seuss ish maybe yeah. not um but 
how you're you're talking to a lot of authors right here how hmm. how did you shift hmm. never wrote yeah that? yeah yeah I, I i i dabbled with that it was going to be a children's book and at the time um it was it was the kind of book i felt motivated to write for me writing was all about being motivated. And frankly, I, I initially, I'll be honest, I lacked, I felt the motivation to write a book that was more in, in, in keeping with what people would expect from me, from me, a business type book would be what people would expect. And I, yes. at the time, I just didn't feel motivated to write that at the time. Yeah. But I, I did feel motivated uh, to write a children's book and began that process. You and I met to talk about that. And then, um, uh, the sort of serendipitous uh, opportunity with Jesse came along. And the more I walked through that journey with him, the the more excited about the possibilities of writing this book became. And so where that motivation uh, I once lacked, it, it, it began to sort of grow slowly uh, to the point that I couldn't not uh, do it. And, and in the end, it was like, you know, this was really the right thing because it's in keeping with my brand. Again, it is kind of meta to to write a book about the value of reading books and how to get the most out of books. Yes. Uh, but uh, but it, it, it seemed like the right thing to do for me and, and to change the title from The Reader's Edge to Read to Lead yeah. and leverage that platform that I'd already you know, spent eight, eight years building. Love it. Love it. Yeah. We're going to go into the lightning round here. Okay. <laughs> okay. The lightning <laughs> round, the fast round here. Um, did you always love to read? And if not, what changed? Mm, yes, I did not always love to read. As a child, I did. My mom you know, took us kids to the library often, read to us okay. often. My mom's responsible for the first, uh, what I would consider the first book club I was ever a part of uh, at home, where she would bring us together and encourage us to read a particular book. And then we'd come together to talk about what we'd read. So she instilled that sort of, uh, you know, uh, desire in me. But then I got to school. And as is the case, unfortunately, for a lot of us, and I don't, I don't mean any uh, ill will sure. towards teachers at yeah. all. Uh, teachers have been some of the most impactful people in my life. My sister's an awesome teacher. It's not teachers. It's the system. School educated out of me, frankly, the, the desire to read and the, the desire to want to learn such mm -hmm. that when I graduated from college, I was like, well, thank goodness all that learning stuff is done. I don't have to do that anymore. My experience with learning, with reading was not a positive one. Yep. So I spent the better part of my 20s not reading. It wasn't until in my early 30s when I was introduced to authors like Seth Godin and John Maxwell and Liz yeah. Weissman and Carrie Oberbrunner ah. that I started uh, developing a desire again to read because I found there were things out there that were written that I could learn from, that were written to my interests, things that I wanted to know more about. Mm. It wasn't just kids' stories and fiction uh, and literature I had no interest in. It was these other things that I really, really wanted to, to learn more about. And that's when my career began to coincidentally, uh, or not so coincidentally, began to explode. I saw six uh, promotions in like 12 or 13 years at my job at the time. And I attribute all that to the, to the reading I was doing. It's true, though. I mean, when you are reading books, I've heard that there's no other form of attaining knowledge as dense as a nonfiction book mm -hmm. uh -huh. and you know it's different it's different than when you're watching or even listening but when you are diving in i mean you know like some books take years um you and i met through the uh, day job to dream job but mm -hmm. i mean it's your life you know and i think there's quotes right. about writing like writing's easy all you do is you sit down to a typewriter and bleed <laughs> it is pretty intense yeah. um now you have someone who just said tanisha it was a pleasure to meet you in person at the igniting souls conference mm. you were a favorite speaker um i brought you in to talk about to authors mm. and some might be like what why would you bring <laughs> a podcaster in but i brought you in Talk about how books and podcasting somehow have this magic relationship. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to your tribe about uh, getting on podcasts and leveraging podcasts uh, to promote their books. I can't tell you how many podcast interviews I've done. I'm, 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 uh, I'm walking the talk here these last few weeks. Yeah. I've been on a lot of podcasts 
uh, to talk about my book. And I love, I love uh, doing that. Um, but the, the great thing for me has been when I started my podcast, I really didn't have any goals related to relationship building or networking mm. or things. I, I wasn't really thinking along those lines. Yes. But I shudder to think what my network would be like, what relationships I wouldn't have had I not started that podcast. It Ooh. happened to be a podcast about interviewing other authors. I've built so many powerful relationships uh, and such that when it came time for, you know, for me to go out and find endorsements. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the publisher said, Hey, it's, it's, it's endorsement time. And I, I went out to make those requests and I, I, I wish now I would have asked more people because they said, well, we need six, six to eight. And so I asked like 10 people and I stopped, <laughs> you know, and only one person wasn't able to, because they were writing a book and had deadlines of their own that they had to deal wow. with. So they had to decline every other person. I asked all nine of those reviews, every one of those said yes. And those are the only other people I asked. Wow. And so it was amazing to me. And that was in large part because I had developed relationships over years with many of these people through, through the podcast. Love it. Love it. Well, listen, we got to give away the winner. Uh, the winner, <laughs> Nikki Nicola, Nikki Nicola is the winner. <laughs> she has been very engaged. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Nikki. Do you know her? Maybe I don't. I don't. I love the name, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she's been uh, very active. I mean, a lot of people have been active on this uh, chat here, folks. Listen, if you're an author, we need people. We need books like this. Okay, mm. we need people like Jeff, and we need books like this, because Jeff, I agree. I mean, I told them um, we got into a debate the other day about um, college and it is it mm. needed, and I told yeah. I told a workshop. I said, listen. I would choose someone way before a college graduate if they told me the last 10 books they read and, and mm. why they made an impact. You know what I'm saying? I, I totally agree with that, Kerry. Um, you know, and I, I've been a college educator. I've taught college courses. So understand that when, uh, when you hear what I'm about to say. I think it's possible and it advantageous for us to create our own curriculums mm. using books. When I was diving into books and they were beginning to impact my career and I was trying new things based on the yeah. books I read, the things I tried that failed, people quickly forgot. The mm -hmm. things that I tried and succeeded got me noticed. And as I got noticed, I began being asked to take what I was learning and teach it to other people in the form of presentations. Well, that's something I hadn't done very much of, presenting. So I thought I need to create a curriculum. I can't go back to school. I'm going to create a curriculum around giving presentations. So I read about presentation design. I read about presentation delivery. I read about I presentation it. structure. I read about getting over the fear of speaking. And little by little, I gained confidence. And obviously, I did it more and more of small groups and then larger groups. And as I did it more and got more confident, my opportunities continued to grow uh, and to climb. But it started with me creating my own public speaking curriculum. I didn't have to go back to school and spend a bunch of money to make that happen. I spent maybe a hundred bucks early on, on my curriculum. That's so good. Folks, read to lead book.com. You have the timer has started. You have until Monday to just massively take this 40% off as well as get the mini, mini course, the audio book, Jeff, I'll tell you what, man, you have blessed us today. We are thrilled for mm. you. Tuesday is launch day. Everybody on social media, blow up this book now <laughs> until Tuesday. And uh, Jeff, thanks for being here today, my friend. Thanks for having me, Kerry. I always love talking to you and appreciate the opportunity to, to share with your tribe about uh, this project very much. Thanks. Awesome. Take care, everybody.